I am back with part two of my turtle series. And we're going to pick it up here on their trip to England and as they try to recapture the glories of Happy Together. My name is Mark Bowman, and uh, I'm from Los Angeles, California. How old are you, Mark? I'm 20. I'm Jim Pons from Los Angeles, California, 24. Howard Kalen, Los Angeles, California, weighing at about 175 <laughs> pounds, black trunks. How old are you? Oh, I'm about 20. And you're 20, and you? Uh, <laughs> Come on, John. Come on, man. You can do it. Hi. Uh, I'm Johnny Barbada. I'm 22 years old. I'm from Passaic, New Jersey. Enjoy it. <laughs> Al Nickel, I'm 21. I'm from Woodland Hills, California. Happy together, and she'd rather be with me, were big enough hits that they could do a tour of England. So they went to London and were somewhat of the darlings. The, the British really liked the Turtles quite a lot. And uh, Graham Nash, who had met the Turtles in Los Angeles, basically greeted them and introduced them to some other people. As soon as they got to London, he had them come over, and Donovan was there, and he had an early copy of Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. So the Turtles heard that at Graham Nash's place with Donovan, and they started to have, as you can imagine, a very good time. So they headed out. There was a rather interesting story that's somewhat famously told by Howard Kalin, and uh, they went out to the clubs and they went to the speakeasy and this is where all the pop stars in London went and some of the first people they saw there were the Beatles. It was John, Paul and George I guess were there that night. It's interesting because uh, you can imagine these guys, you know, Hendrix, they, they met him, they met uh, Brian Jones of the Stones and all these other people. And uh, this particular night, uh, Howard Kalin tells a story of how John Lennon was rude to rhythm guitar player Jim Tucker. And then our idiot rhythm player, I think I can say that with impunity, because um, I hate the guy, uh, <laughs> uh, went up uh, to John Lennon to shake his hand. The guy was wearing a three-piece mohair suit, the same suit he had worn on the plane, because we went there that quickly. Uh, he had a, a kind of a Nero-ish uh, shag haircut. He was a skinny guy. He was trying to look all mod. And Lennon said, oh, you're lovely, aren't you? You're a lovely piece of work. What the hell is your name? And he said, well, Jim Tucker. And Lennon comes back and goes, Tucker? Tucker? They call you Tucko? Tucko? I can have quite a bit of fun with that name. Let's see. Tucko, Tucko. And he started rhyming. Well, by the time he got to fucko, Jim was getting a little pissed. And it was just hurtful and harmful. And uh, at some point, Jim Tucker, the rhythm player, said, you know, you're an ass, man. I'm really sorry I met you. And Lennon said, you never did, son. You never did. And that was it. Jim Tucker turned around. He walked out of the club. He got on a plane. He went home. He never played music again. He quit the group. And uh, uh, we were never a six-piece band again after that. So Kaylin suggests that Tucker couldn't handle this incident and immediately went home. Well, really, that's not how it happened. I, I understand that it, a few days later is when Tucker left. Tucker had gotten sick. Kaylin was also a bit sick, and they canceled some dates. And I don't know if the whole band went home early, but Tucker certainly did. And Tucker denies that this Lennon incident was anything uh of importance. And when a, one band member says that he's an idiot or he hates him, I mean, there might be some agenda there. So maybe you take some of that with a grain of salt. Either way, they came back from London and they, it was a very uh, positive experience uh, musically for them and they were received very well by the Brits. So at this time, they had to start coming up with their next single because they had all these hits with Bonner and Gordon and they wanted to keep the ball rolling. So at this point we're in early 1968 and the first single that they released at this time was Sound Asleep, which was an original song by Kalen and Volman, and this song only hit number 57. Now the follow-up was a song by rising star Harry Nilsson, The Story of Rock and Roll, and it only hit number 48. So they were starting to stall on the pop charts. So 
So one of the reasons these singles were flops, I believe, is that the band had convinced White Whale that they should produce themselves, which they did. And I think they were a little bit full of themselves, having come back from England and had partied with the Beatles and the Stones and Hendrix. And I think they had uh, a little bit of a heightened sense of their talents. And it shows on some of the B-sides of these two singles where they went in a real full-out psychedelic direction. Naturally, White Whale was concerned about the low charting singles and they started to pressure the band. What made matters worse is the band was going through other problems with their management. They, by this time, they were on their fourth or fifth manager and there's a very comical video that Mark Volman and Howard Kalin make discussing the history of their managers. And it's about a four and a half minute video and this is a part of it. What a lot of people don't know is the Turtles were in lawsuits from 1966 to 1974. We trusted everybody, we believed, and we'd sign anything. Here's a brief description of the managerial problems faced by a rock and roll band, us. Here's what happened. First of all, our first manager came along. He's the guy who owned the nightclub, remember him? Yeah. He convinced us he was good by telling us, I'm your manager. We signed. We believed Good him. enough for us. Manager number one, now we got a manager. We oh, went bye. out on the road. So we sign with manager number four. We're now with manager number four, and he brings in a lawyer. Let's just call her lawyer. And she's really bad for us. Oh, she ruins our man. career really bad, as if we needed help. Can we, we just reiterate, manager number one, still suing us. Two okay. and a half million dollars. So check out the rest of the video. I'll put the link below, because it's really funny. It really sums up the problems they had from a managerial standpoint. White Whale was desperate for the Turtles to come up with a hit to match the success of 1967's Happy Together. That's kind of crazy to ask that because it's one of those one in a lifetime hits. Nonetheless, record companies are record companies. So the band, they were, they responded in a way that the Turtles typically responded with humor. The band, um, one thing I didn't talk about a lot is they always had a lot of humor in their shows. They brought frivolity to the stage act and it also uh, permeated through their music as well. Now one of the things that they tried to do here, uh, I think they were getting fed up with the record label at this point quite a bit in management, all, all, all parts of the record business. And Howard Kalin started to write essentially a parody of Happy Together. And he started writing a joke, a joke song. And they gave, uh, they presented something to the record company thinking that they would say, okay guys, go back to writing what you want. This is not gonna work. This is goofy, uh, not gonna work. But the, the record label said, that's it, we love it. So that became the single Eleanor. So Eleanor hit number six in the Billboard chart. So another big hit, million seller, and they started to record the next album. But they had the, the sense to bring in a producer and they brought in Chip Douglas to produce. And this was the next album. This is called The Turtles Present The Battle of the Bands. Now this is somewhat of a response to Sgt. Pepper where they were doing, pretending they were a bunch of different bands and doing different styles of music. And they really seem to make a nice blend of this, this pop sound that they had created with these wonderful vocals and the slightly psychedelic direction and humorous uh, direction that they were, they were using in their music and on stage. And I keep mentioning Frank Zappa and there's a couple songs on here that feel a little bit more Mother's Invention like a song called Food and then a very funny song called Chief Kamana Wanalea. For the Turtles' next single, uh, 
This was almost as unlikely as a single as Eleanor was. And this song called You Show Me was another big hit. This also hit number six on the charts, big, um, another million seller. And this song was a song that was originally done by the Birds. Now the Birds were doing this song uh, very early on in their stage act. And it was more of an acoustic song. They cut it on uh, their, their pre-flight recordings and it sounded like this. You show me how to do exactly what you do, how I fell in love with you. Now this song was brought to the band by Chip Douglas and the only thing he had to play it on to them was this old pump organ. It was extremely slow the way he played it and the band said that sounds great. So they recorded the song in a very slow tempo, essentially making a psychedelic ballad. So some of the other songs that we're recording at this time but were unreleased are more psychedelic songs called The Owl and To See The Sun. The Turtles spent 80% of the time on the road and they were working really hard and probably suffering from a little bit of burnout. And I think that there were some other things working against them that even to this day, I don't think people take them that seriously. They consider them more of a singles band. And I think their image was a little bit cartoony because let's face it, these front men, Howard Kalin and Mark Volman, weren't exactly man they idols. Kalin wasn't Jim Morrison. But the one thing the, the Turtles did bring, and one of their special, the special parts of their sound was Kalen's voice. And I always thought that he had a great, a great delivery that had a lot of feeling and a lot of passion in his voice. And he's instantly recognizable when you hear his voice. And that made the Turtles very special. Your looks intoxicate me Even though your folks hate me There's no one like Now one funny story that happened around this time is that they were invited to play the White House for Trisha Nixon's birthday party. The Turtles were her favorite band and they were invited and they accepted. And one of the funny things was is that uh, they, well they enjoyed themselves thoroughly, maybe a little too much. And one of the funny stories was that the Secret Service men got really uptight with them because a metronome went off in their luggage and they thought it was a bomb. And let's just put it this way, they did more than frisk the Turtles. The Turtles made a personnel change at this point, and Johnny Barbada, the drummer, ended up leaving. He ended up joining Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young, and eventually after that he played with Jefferson Airplane. Barbada was a fine drummer, but one of the guys that started hanging around the band was a guy named John Sider, and he played drums with Spanky and Our Gang. And Spanky and Our Gang was starting to break up, and Sider was just a natural replacement. He fit in really great with the band, and he added another high harmony vocal. Okay, I'm going to end part two right here. And the reason I'm going into a third part here is I want to include more music because I want you to hear some of the great artistic skills that these guys have. And you can only do that if you hear the music. So I'm doing some of the heavy lifting for you so you guys won't have to go out digging for this stuff. So stay tuned for the next Turtles video here on Pop Goes the 60s. You showed me how to say